In a previous video animation, we considered what GitHub branches are and how to manage feature branches so that we can isolate work from our master branch and then pull that work in when needed and that will grow our master branch. The other advantage being if a feature is not ready by branch cut date, we can hold that feature for a later branch. So we know that GitHub branches and any kind of version control branches give us a lot of nice capabilities. The ability to have a snapshot of the project at one time and work in a sandbox, the ability to have multiple developers working together, and the fact that one delayed feature won't hold up an entire release. So in this video, we're going to see how to create a feature branch in Visual Studio with the C-sharp Razor Page project. We're looking at a project now that I've already started in Visual Studio and have already connected to a GitHub repository. When we take a look down at the bottom, we see master, which is the first branch, the default branch. And when I click, we can see any other branches. At the moment, there are not any other branches. We'll see the same thing on GitHub. The only branch we see is master. We can create a new branch on GitHub or we can create a new branch right here. Let's go ahead and create a new branch here. We get a box up in the Team Explorer section in the upper right that asks us some questions about our branch. So when I'm teaching or lecturing, a lot of times I'll use feature branches to coordinate several related commits together and at the same time keep them separate from all of the other commits. That makes it a little bit easier to read everything in one theme. So many times I will name the branch after what I'm doing. We'll call this one UI Updates. We're creating this from master. We could branch off of any other branch, really. So we're creating this from master. We're going to check it out and create branch. But when I hit create branch, just pay attention to that little master down below. And we see now that it says UI updates. I can click and we can see that I have master and UI updates as my two different branches. And I can switch back and forth between the two. Let's take a look at our repository. And we'll see that master is still the only branch on the repository because we have not yet pushed any changes. So let's make a change. We'll make a relatively straightforward change. We have welcome to my plant diary. Maybe we want to customize this so that we can configure it for different users. Maybe we partner with some florists or some landscapers and we can customize it and put their brand name there. So for that, we're going to go to the code behind page and we need to pass some information from this code behind class to our CSHTML file that is essentially the HTML that the user will eventually see. Now remember, if you remember looking through some debuggers before, that when we first render a page, it's essentially a read operation, so it's going to invoke on get. Anything we need to do to prepare a page, we should put in this on get method, or we should at least have this on get method call another method to do that work. So let's start by thinking of some of the fundamental structures of programming. First of all, anytime we have a variable, we need a type, which is a data type. It says how to interpret those zeros and ones. And we need a name. And the name is what keeps one variable unique from another variable. We can't have two variables with the same name. So for example, if I want to store a whole number, I might use a type int, and then we'll give it a variable name, year started. And right now I have declared the variable year started. I've not put anything in it yet. Now we initialize it the very first time we assign something to that variable. So we'll say 2006 and terminate with a semicolon because we'll terminate any of our lines with a semicolon. Now we'll say string title equals my plant diary established and we'll leave it just like so. Once again, terminate with a semicolon. So you see here the data type is string and the name is title. Finally, what we can do, I'll put a comment here with the two slashes. I'll say pass the data to our UI page. So we'll say view data, and then we'll say brand equals title plus year started. Now that's kind of funny. We have a number and we have a string where string is to just test text, and we're adding them together here. Well, that's actually the concatenation operator. So it's going to take this string and it's going to concatenate the number 2006 on the end of it. In other words, not add it together, just put it on the end. But the important part is, you see that we're putting this in a, let's call this an array or some type of variable called view data. Maybe it's an array, maybe it's a map or a hash of some kind. 
But either way, we're putting it in this variable called view data, and specifically we're putting it in a box called brand within this variable called view data. We just made up that box called brand. We could call it whatever we want, but the view data we do want to keep just like this, capital V, capital D, and then the square brackets. The reason why that's important is we can now access this on the HTML page that's going to be rendered. So you see that view data is essentially a conduit to go from code behind to front end. Or we could even go from one CSHTML page to another, because this one's kind of interesting. You see, in this case, we're assigning home page to the view data title. The reason we're doing that is the layout page that coordinates the entire layout pulls that value back out and it makes it the title that you'll see on the browser going atop the page. And that's parameterized because if we take a look at privacy, you notice that it's assigning privacy policy to that title. And indeed, if we look at our application while it's running, look at the title in the tab here. You see home page here, you see privacy policy here. So in this case, each of the individual CSHTML files are populating this title variable, and that's being used by the layout. In our case, though, we want to do things a little bit differently. Instead of the CSHTML populating the, the view data, we're populating it from our code behind, and then we want to use that data that we're passing into our code behind into our HTML page itself. So let's start by copying this view data brand. And then I'm going to put it up here in the heading section of our CSHTML page. So at this point, we have access to the data in this view data brand compartment. We simply need to assign it to a variable. So why don't we just say var brand equals view data brand. I happen to use the same name there. That's not mandatory. I could call it anything. I could call it foo if I wanted to. So we do that up here in the page model in the header section. Now, once that's done, we can reference this local variable right inside our HTML. So let's say, welcome to, and then to reference a variable from above, we start with the at symbol and then the variable name brand, just like so, and save. I relaunch our application and take a look at what we have now. Welcome to My Plant Diary, established 2006. So you see that was assembled in the code behind and then it was presented in our user interface. I like what we've done here, so let's go ahead and commit. We're not going to push just yet, we'll simply commit. So let's say create a dynamic. Now that looks good, but it's not really that dynamic, is it? Because we've hard coded in my plant diary. So what I want to do is get the brand name from the URL. What I mean by that is one of the name value pairs that you'll see in the URL that often follows a question mark. I want to set it up like that. And so the name before the equal sign will be constant and then the value to the right of the equal sign will be that brand name. We can use something called request.query to get that in our C-sharp program. And it works just like the view data that we just saw because it's like a map. We pass in a key as a string and that key is that name from the name value pair. So we'll call it brand name, just like so. And then we'll assign that to a new variable, string brand name equals request.query brand name. Now we have to keep in mind that the first time we access the page and many times thereafter, that brand name might not be populated. So let's fall back to our, our default if it's not populated. I'll put in an if test here. We'll say if brand name equal equal null, which means there's not an object in there, or brand name dot length equal equal zero, which means there is an object present. It simply has no characters in it. If that's the case, we're going to go ahead and use our default. And I'm going to do a bit of refactoring here. I'm going to take this concatenation operation, put it in the if test, and assign that to brand name. So you see that we are assigning a default value to brand. And then to complete the puzzle, view data brand equals brand name. So we kind of have to think about how this is going to work. If we got it from the query, we got it up here. We're going to skip this if test body. We're going to take the query value, the URL value, and assign it over here. On the other hand, if nothing came from the query, we go with our default and we assign it. Let's go ahead, save, take a look in the debugger.
The first time the page loads, there's nothing up in the URL, so it goes to our default. Welcome to my plant diary. Let's go ahead and add question mark brand name equals checkers plants. And now you see welcome to checkers plants. Let's snap a breakpoint, just watch it work. I'll change it to checkers wonderful plants this time. And as a matter of fact, we can escape that with a plus to give some spacing between those and enter. And notice that Visual Studio lights up orange to tell us that something has changed. So remember our debug keys. F10 is step over. So when I step over, the brand name should be populated. And sure enough, we see brand name checkers wonderful plants. And remember, I can change this in here in the debugger if I wish, part of the advantage of using the debugger. Now the brand name is not null, it's checkers wonderful plants. And the brand name is not zero because Checkers Wonderful Plants probably has about 25 letters. So when I press F10, I anticipate we're going to skip from this if part all the way down to the end, and we're going to assign Checkers Wonderful Plants to the view data collection. So there we go. And finally, F5 to continue. And we come back and we see Checkers Wonderful Plants. Now, what if we go ahead and take off that entire query param and go to the default? I hit enter. Once again, we'll walk through and we'll see F10. Brand name is null because it was not passed in through the URL. So now we're going to go through our default logic. We're going to assign our year started variable, our title variable, then put them together in brand name, and then finally pass that brand name to our page. Okay, wonderful new feature. Naturally, the whole idea here is we wanted to have another commit. So we'll go ahead and stop. And in Solution Explorer, I'm going to get and commit parameterize brand name. Commit, I can refresh our remote GitHub and we can confirm we only have four commits and we only have one branch. But here's where things change. I've made two commits locally and I'm about to push them up to Git. So let's go to sync and we see our two commits that we made earlier, parameterize brand name and create a dynamic file. But that's not all we're doing. We're also going to push a brand new branch called UI updates. So let, let's hit push on outgoing commits. And as that's pushing, we'll come over and take a look at our repository. And we see that the UI automatically updated to say UI updates had recent, recent pushes less than a minute ago, and it's prompting us to do a compare and pull request. In other words, here where we are on our animation, we've just made our commit, we've pushed, and now it's asking us to do a pull request, which takes these changes and makes them eligible to be pulled and merged into master. Now, what's important here is that little purple bubble represents our two commits. So you notice that the two commits are currently on feature branch one, they're not on master, and they won't be on master until we do a pull request and then a merge, and then they'll be part of master. I'll follow that link in just a moment, but first let's look at our two branches and let's look at the commit history. So we see that master still has four commits, only four commits, but now let's take a look at UI updates. UI updates has the four commits from master plus the two commits that we just made. We want to get those two additional commits into master, which is when we do the pull request. So let's go ahead and compare and do pull request. And we can leave some kind of comments like update a dynamic brand name and then create pull request. Now at this point, the changes are not yet in master. They're simply staged to go to master. We have to merge to get them to go to master. But a nice thing here is we can have a conversation with our teammates. We can say, I made these changes so that our web assets can be used across other brands. And then you can comment. Here's another really cool thing. Go to Files Changed, and you can make comments directly here in code without impacting the code. So we might say something like, can we store year started as a string because we're unlikely to perform math on it? Something like that. So we can have a conversation back and forth and then your teammate can reply and say, well, I thought about that, but maybe an int is more efficient for memory storage and that's why I went with an int. So our code becomes the basis of a conversation. And then once we're finished and we're satisfied, we scroll down 
And we really hope to see this here, which is this branch has no conflicts with the base branch. At this time, we can merge. So I click Merge, and I confirm Merge. And it says, Pull request successfully merged and closed. So at this point, we've officially drawn that line and brought our commit history back into master. As a matter of fact, let's take a look at master. I'm simply going to refresh this page, and we see that we have our two commits from our feature branch, and we have an additional commit, which is the merge commit. Let's go back to Visual Studio. And I actually could have done the pull request from here as well, uh, but I'll tell you what I want to do is I want to go ahead and go back to master at the moment, just in Visual Studio. And let's take a look at Solution Explorer and index.cshtml.cs. We look and, holy smokes, where are my changes? They're not here. I go to the HTML file and, oh my gosh, all those changes I made are not here. So have I lost everything? Well, no, I haven't. But once again, look, note that my branch is now master. I simply click on sync or I can do a pull as well and that will bring down those changes because remember we did the pull request on github so our local visual studio doesn't know about it but as soon as i do a sync it will find out about it so we can see here we have the parameterization in our index.cshtml and if we look at the code behind the cshtml.cs we have our updates there as well so at this point everything's in master and if we wanted we could actually orphan the ui updates branch it's no longer needed now you don't necessarily have to use feature branches. You could put everything in master and you're essentially going to get the same history that we see here. The advantage of using feature branches though is the ability to have kind of like a, a little theme or a story that you can tell to the side. You can work to the side and then you can only merge when complete. So I hope this video has been helpful and I look forward to reading your comments. Thank you.